this is the last part of the chapter, the last section of the chapter. And it's a rather long one because it's a overview of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to take a tour of all seven parts and talk about the importance of each part to different everyday applications. So let's look at the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is all frequencies of different electromagnetic waves. And just to remind you, if we're in a vacuum, the speed of light is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. And because the speed of light is constant, as the wavelength increases, the frequency goes down. As the frequency increases, the wavelength gets smaller. Now, of course, we're familiar with visible light. That's the light that we can see, which roughly runs from about 400 to 700 nanometers. But here we're going to see wavelengths that are in the tens, if not hundreds of kilometers, going down to sizes that are even smaller than the nucleus of the atom. Now, it's important to understand that there's no sharp division between some of these parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, for instance, there's a very large overlap in X-rays and gamma rays, and there's also an overlap in infrared mi and microwaves. Possibly microwaves and, and radio waves can also be considered to have a large overlap. We're going to treat these as, as separate sections of the electromagnetic spectrum, but please understand this is open to interpretation. So here it is, the seven parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. We start from the longer wavelengths, the radio waves down here. And again, radio waves can have incredibly large wavelengths, tens of kilometers. In some cases, if you want to talk about very low frequency waves, you can essentially go as large as you want. Next to the radio waves at shorter wavelengths are the microwaves. And the microwaves are, in many respects, just shorter wavelength, higher frequency radio waves. As we go from right to left, the wavelengths are getting smaller. As we go from right to left, the frequencies are going up and the energy per photon is going up also. We'll talk about that in a little bit. After microwaves, we have infrared light. Now, infrared light, as its name implies, is light or electromagnetic radiation, which is slightly longer than the visible part of the spectrum. The visible part of the spectrum is what we can see. And in fact, I've exaggerated the width of the visible part of the spectrum with regard to the other parts of the, the spectrum. And this is really a logarithmic chart here because we're not looking at the wavelength in terms of uh, a, you know, a linear increase or decrease in, in wavelength size. This is actually logarithmic. So going to the right, the wavelengths are getting exponentially larger. Going to the left, the frequencies are getting exponentially larger. After visible light, we have our first ionizing radiation, and that's UV light. Ultraviolet light means, as its name implies, light beyond the violet part of the spectrum. Next to ultraviolet light, we have X-rays. And again, there's a large overlap between X-rays and gamma rays because of their source. X-rays are typically from electrons, whereas gamma rays are typically nuclear radiation. In some cases, they're created by um, other forms of uh, phenomena. You know, astronomical objects such as uh, quasars are capable of accelerating particles to produce gamma rays also. And again, here's another look at the electromagnetic spectrum. This shows some overlap between the different uh, parts of the spectrum, but um, we again are, are going to sort of treat the electromagnetic spectrum as three, I'm sorry, seven discrete ranges. So we've been dealing with electromagnetic waves in their classical form, meaning that we've been treating them essentially as oscillating electric and magnetic fields. In this part, on this slide, we see that we can actually quantize electromagnetic waves into photons. And the energy of each individual photon is equal to Planck's constant. This is H in the SI system. H is equal to 6.6 
262 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. A joule is a very large amount of energy for a photon. So oftentimes, instead of using joules, we will use electron volts. An electron volt is the amount of energy that an electron would get by moving in a one volt potential. And here we can see uh, H is 4.1357 times 10 to the negative 15 electron volt seconds. So if you take your frequency and you multiply it by H, you're going to get the energy per photon, either in joules, if you use the top form for H, or in the lower quantity for H, 4.1357 times 10 to the minus 15 EV seconds, you're going to get back electron volts. So here we have the electromagnetic spectrum, the seven parts once again. And on the top right here, we see all the different wavelengths. Again, radio waves going out to over 100 kilometers, going the other way. The gamma rays going to smaller than one femtometer or Fermi. That is the size of a nucleus. So there's a very, very large range of magnitudes for electromagnetic waves, wavelengths, or I should say, we're, we're, we're spanning many magnitudes in terms of the wavelength. Now, on the bottom of this chart, you can see the different frequencies going from the lowest frequencies in radio waves up to the highest frequencies in gamma rays. And then below that, we have the energies in electron volts. And it's sort of convenient to remember that, um, you know, electron volt is roughly about the energy of visible light. So that can give you a very good uh, relationship uh, when, you're, when you're talking about how much energy does an X-ray have, how much energy does a gamma ray have. And I think this is, this is a little bit off here. We should probably move the scale a little bit to the right um, because again, visible light is about one electron volt. Starting with radio waves. We're dealing with the longest wavelength. We're dealing with the lowest frequency. And the way that we define radio waves here is going to be 300 megahertz. This is somewhat arbitrary, I will agree. You look other places and you might see something different. That means that radio waves will be any type of electromagnetic wave, by our definition, greater than one meter. And again, some definitions have the microwave part of the spectrum um, being a member of the radio spectrum. So radio waves have a frequency um, of uh, 3.0 times 10 to the 8 hertz. Again, go back to the uh, equation that we had for uh, C being equal to wavelength times frequency. And you'll recognize, well, if you have a one meter wave, you're going to get 3 times 10 to the 8 hertz or 300 megahertz. So radio waves are really quite simple to create. One of the easiest ways that we create radio waves is with a dipole antenna. As its name implies, it alternates with a positive and negative charge moving up and down each of the elements of the dipole antenna. This creates a radio wave that uh, radiates in all directions. And essentially all our electromagnetic waves are going to be generated in a similar way with some type of oscillating dipole. It's just that the scales are going to get smaller and smaller as the wavelengths get smaller also. Radio waves are typically broken into uh, wavelength ranges and... Uh, you know, when, when we're looking at radio waves, you'll hear sometimes VHF, HF, MF, LF, VLF. These are all short for very high frequency, high frequency, medium frequency, low frequency, and very low frequency. So it's just a way of breaking up the, the radio spectrum itself to tell you where you are with respect to both uh, wavelength or more importantly, where you are with respect to frequency. Now, here is another chart. It shows you uh, some of the application for these different frequency range. Um, here, 
down here, we'll see that this has applications in communications of submarines. Um, then we have low frequency used for atomic clocks, medium frequency used for aircraft, AM radio, high frequency used for, again, um, amateur radio, ham radio. Ship and aircraft also use a high frequency. Very high frequency was very popular for commercial broadcasts. For a long time, VHF was where we would have our FM radio broadcasts, but it would also be where most television broadcasts would come from. UHF represents the frequencies which are in the microwave, and we'll talk about that when we get to the microwave part of the spectrum. So really, for our definition of radio waves, we're going from VLF, the lowest of the frequencies, to VHF, which is the highest of the frequencies. Yeah, and very low frequencies, not many common applications for this. Because these are very long wavelengths, they actually penetrate deep beneath the surface of the ocean. So commonly we'll see them for communicating with submarines and uh, for remote locations. The problem is the frequency is so low that they have very little bandwidth. So if you want to send a message, you're not gonna send very inf much information. At three kilohertz to 30 kilohertz, you don't have very much bandwidth available. Low frequency, these are uh, primarily used by the military, but also for uh, timing signals. If you ever bought one of these uh, so-called atomic clocks, they are relying on real atomic clocks to provide the, the time. The time is then broadcast over this radio signal, and um, these radio waves propagate along the surface of the Earth, can travel a very long distance, don't send very much information, but if you're only sending a, a timestamp, um, you don't need to send a lot of information. So low frequency, this is used to control some of these clocks. Medium frequency, this is where some of the first commercial broadcasts took place. Uh, AM radio is uh, part of the medium frequency spectrum. And, um, you know, other applications do include uh, submarine and aircraft navigation uh, beacons. Higher frequency, we're getting to larger amounts of bandwidth. So the sound quality for analog and the data transmission for digital is getting better and better. Um, again, the ham operators, these are, are amateur radio operators, uh, use this frequency quite often. Uh, sometimes it's known as short wave radio because it is a shorter wavelength than the medium frequency that was talked about before. By far, one of the most popular frequencies for commercial broadcasts in the radio spectrum was VHF. And again, we still have FM radio broadcasts, which are broadcast over these frequencies. And um, originally, back when we still had cathode ray tubes for televisions, that's where you would get the analog broadcasts. Now the broadcasts have moved up to UHF, which is technically, according to our definition, uh, microwaves. And again, we can go through the radio spectrum, talk about different allocations that the government makes or different frequencies. This is a nice chart that shows you some of the, the VHF allocations that are made by the uh, the government. Um, this is out of date because we don't have the analog stations anymore. Where you see TV channel two to six, TV channel seven to 13, TV channel 14 to 51, um, these have been reallocated for other uses. So this is an old chart. Now, radio waves are used in astronomy because radio waves and some microwaves are the only types of electromagnetic radiation that actually make it through the atmosphere without getting absorbed in significant quantities. So there are two windows in our atmosphere. There's two places where electromagnetic waves can easily make it to the surface of the Earth. Again, in the visible 
and also in that microwave uh, radio part of the spectrum, which you see right here, roughly between 10 centimeters and 10 meters. That's where these satellite dishes, well, they're not really satellite dishes, these are radio telescopes, will operate. All the other parts of the spectrum, we need to put a satellite in orbit to absorb, I'm sorry, to avoid this absorbance and observe these frequencies. Radio waves are useful for an astronomy because plasmas, very, very hot gases, uh, tend to give off radio waves. This is a active galaxy right here. The white shows you the visible. And at its center, it's called an active galaxy because at its center, it has a supermassive black hole. And this black hole, as it absorbs material, it gives off very hot jets of gas. And these hot lobes of plasma, which are, are blasted into the uh, surrounding regions, actually are much larger than the visible part of the galaxy that we can see. Here's a radio wave picture of a neighboring galaxy. And we can see here, actually, I believe it's Andromeda. It's our largest big neighbor. Here we can see in uh, the radio part of the spectrum, we can see hydrogen gas, molecular hydrogen gas, where new stars are being formed. And again, very useful tool in astronomy, the radio telescope. The radio telescope doesn't so much produce a picture like a conventional telescope. It actually uses um, interferometry to basically reconstruct uh, a picture. So um, instead of using a single radio telescope, oftentimes what they'll do is use an array of telescopes or use telescopes throughout the world. The Event Horizon Telescope, in fact, used radio telescopes throughout the world to reconstruct the image from radio waves that were being given off by a black hole at the center of our galaxy and a black hole in uh, the galaxy. I think it was M81. I'm probably going to get that wrong. But these were the first two pictures ever taken of a black hole, and it was taken in the radio part of the spectrum. Now, microwaves, not all that much different than radio waves. They're just slightly smaller in wavelength, slightly higher in frequency. The applications for microwaves also are communication. But because microwaves interact with water molecules very easily, they're also used in weather radar and also in microwave ovens where the water molecules will absorb the microwaves and convert it to heat. Here are the different parts of the microwave spectrum using the abbreviations uh, similar to the abbreviations that we had for radio waves. We see UHF here, SHF here, and EHF here. UHF is ultra high frequency. SHF, I hope I'm gonna get this right, is super high frequency. And EHF is extremely high frequency. Now, if we, we can also classify the frequencies for microwave in other parts. I'm not as familiar with this, so I'll just go with uh, this uh, chart that I saw. And you can see, there's these different bands which are used. Here we have the traditional microwave bands which are used. There's a V band, an E band, a W band, and a D band. And these are all basically used for communication. We'll see that um, in terms of Wi-Fi, uh, cell communication, they're all basically broadcasting and uh, receiving in the microwave part of the spectrum. So ultra high frequency, actually, again, low frequency microwaves. This is from 300 megahertz to three gigahertz. That gives you a wavelength size between from 10 centimeters to one meter. And um, again, just think of them as basically higher frequency radio waves. They are in the microwave part of the spectrum as uh, we see them. 
digital television is not all that popular over broadcast it does exist most subscribers uh either stream or uh receive well you know you're really receiving almost everything digitally over coax cables or fiber optic so um, if you're not receiving your television signals directly through uh, a fiber optic or, or a coax you um might be using these digital broadcasts in the UHF part of the spectrum. The old television was broadcast in the VHF part of the radio spectrum. Now we've gone to a higher frequency. And higher frequencies have the advantage that they have more bandwidth. We can carry more information. And the reason why they have more bandwidth is at a higher frequency. Well, obviously, the available frequencies to broadcast are going to be much greater. So, um, microwave is, is superior to radio waves in that it can carry more information. It's it has its problems because it attenuates much faster. It's absorbed by water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it might not be able to, uh, propagate as far. Telephones basically use a uh, different microwave frequencies, um, I guess basically due to overcrowding, lower bands were um, given up. And um, I think now most cordless telephones will use 5.8 uh, gigahertz. Just about every phone is cordless. You have to be old like me to remember phones with cords. Uh, so cell phones also use microwave frequencies. They communicate with a cell tower and basically, each cell tower develops one or more cells that uh, you can pass seamlessly from one to the other as you move from one cell to the other. Satellite radio, also microwaves. Satellite television uses microwaves. Why? Because you want a large bandwidth to send a lot of information. Not only does radar help us see weather, it also allows us to see different uh, aircraft. And aviation radar, even though most aircraft have uh, transmitters that will transmit their, their, their location, uh, the radar itself also bounces off the metallic shell of the aircraft so that uh, we can avoid having aircraft collide. Aviation radar was uh, started in um, England in World War II. And it became a very important technology for the military throughout World War II and afterward. Wi-Fi, again, Wi-Fi uses microwave signals to communicate with different remote devices that you would need, your computer, your cell phone, if it operates over Wi-Fi in addition to the cell towers. Um, Many different digital devices throughout the home will utilize Wi-Fi. And um, Wi-Fi basically operates around 2.4 gigahertz. Okay, that's 2.4 billion oscillations per second or 5 gigahertz. And these are the different standards that um, have been introduced. And you can see that as time goes by, they've been able to increase the number of megabits per second to increase the amount of data which is being transmitted. Um, extremely high frequency from 30 gigahertz to uh, 300 gigahertz is used for very large transmission of data. There is a standard for gigabit uh, communication which operates in this realm but um let me be honest with you i really don't have a lot of information about it i don't have a lot of familiar i'm not very familiar with it <clears throat> and of course traffic radar to determine the speed of vehicles police will employ a beam of microwaves they bounce it off your vehicle and when it returns to the transmitter the transmission frequency and the Doppler shifted reflected frequency are compared. 
and the Doppler shifting due to your speed will help them determine how fast you were traveling. Obviously, the faster you're traveling toward or away from the microwave beam source, the more Doppler shift it's going to become. Weather radar, weather radar bounces a microwave beam off of the water molecules. As water is falling in the form of precipitation, it reflects, it rescatters, it absorbs microwaves. You know, you think that because water very efficiently absorbs microwaves, it wouldn't be a good scatterer. But uh, in actuality, yes, it absorbs, but it also scatters the microwave signal so that we can create an image of what we are, what the what the precipitation is doing. And of course, microwaves in astronomy extremely important. The signal from the Big Bang, what we call cosmic background radiation. It was discovered in New Jersey, right down in Monmouth County, Homedale, New Jersey. Um, the first microwave signal from the Big Bang was discovered, and this helped um, support the theory that the universe was expanding. So great things happen in New Jersey. Now we jump to the infrared part of the spectrum. Again, there's no place where suddenly the um, microwaves begin to behave like, you know, light. It's really these electromagnetic waves are getting smaller and smaller. The frequency is getting higher and higher. So far infrared does behave more like microwaves. In fact, there's technically an overlap in some ways that the spectra is, is, is uh, defined between the microwaves and the infrared. But as it gets closer and closer to higher frequencies and shorter wavelengths where we can start seeing it, it acts more like visible light. So infrared light is just light below the frequency of which our eye can detect. It's used for night vision. It's used for thermal vision. And most surprisingly, most people think fiber optics carry visible light. If you were to cut a fiber optic used in communication and it was in operation at the time you cut it, you wouldn't see anything. Why? Because the infrared light, even though it's near the visible part of the spectrum, it is not detectable by the eye. This picture that you see here of these fiber optics, the reason why we see this light here is because the camera was also sensitive to near infrared light. So here are the different parts of the infrared spectrum. You've got long wavelength IR, which is down here, far infrared, which is almost off the screen, okay? That's mo most like the um, microwave part of the spectrum. Mid infrared, short infrared, and then near infrared, right on the edge of what we can see. In fact, if it's very bright, if it's like, you know, 800 nanometers, and it's really bright. Um, you can see infrared, but um, it's usually at intensities that are not good for the eye. So near infrared, short wave infrared, mid wavelength infrared, long wavelength infrared, and far infrared. And here's what they might look like if they're placed on the electromagnetic spectrum. Over to the left, um, as with the other charts, we have the visible part of the spectrum, that little rainbow that we see right there. And of course, uh, near infrared is right next to that. Your short infrared, mid infrared, long infrared, and far infrared goes deep. See, this is 15 micrometers, 15 microns. Far infrared goes way off the screen out to about a thousand microns or one millimeter. Here is a far infrared image of the constellation Orion. Uh, Orion's one of the easiest constellations to see in the winter sky. And it has the Great Orion Nebula, which you probably don't realize is the Great Orion Nebula is actually a place where stars are being born. What you might also not 
realize is the Orion Nebula is over a huge molecular cloud where there's a tremendous amount of star formation taking place. And we can't see that in the visible. We can only see the Orion Nebula, which is really the tip of the iceberg. It's actually part of a massive, massive molecular cloud, which extends well beyond the familiar constellation that we see in the nighttime sky. Long wavelength infrared, this is the type of infrared that we oftentimes use for thermal imagery. Um, you know, here's a, a thermal picture of a human being showing where the surface of our skin gives off the most amount of energy. But a very useful thermal image is one of a home where we can see these windows are not very good at keeping the heat in. They actually radiate quite a bit of heat. So if a homeowner was looking at this house, they might think about replacing this window, this window, and possibly this window up here. Mid wavelength infrared is typically given off by objects that are much warmer than room temperature. Going back to long wavelength infrared, things that are at our body temperature, things that are around room temperature, they give off wavelengths around 8 to 15 micrometers or microns. If you had vision at around 10 microns, you could see people glow in the dark. And in fact, that's what pit vipers are able to do. They have pits on their, their heads, which basically are infrared sensors that allow them to hunt small mammals. Mid-infrared is used more by the military. Jet engines are much hotter. And because of their hot thermal exhaust, they make easy infrared targets for heat-seeking missiles. So the military will put cameras on the tips of the Sidewinder missiles. They operate, again, in the mid-infrared part of the spectrum. This is roughly from about 3 to 8 microns. And, you know, visible light's about half a micron, just to give you some perspective here. <clears throat> and they will actually hone in on the heat signatures from the aircraft. Now, unfortunately, I've put up a commercial aircraft. Hopefully, that's not what they're used on, and hopefully they're not really used for anything beyond deterrence. The B-2, um, the upcoming B-21 bomber, the F-35 Lightning II, all place their exhausts on top of the aircraft to make it difficult for a heat-seeking missile to get at them. It actually allows them to cool the exhaust off uh, to make them less of a target. When a plane has been locked on by a missile, they can use uh, chaff to basically create a false signal for radar equipped missiles and flares to basically deceive heat seeking missiles. And again, short wavelength infrared operating uh, from about 1.3 micrometers to about three micrometers. This is used by fiber optics. As we go to shorter wavelengths, as we go to higher frequency, we are able to carry more information because we have more bandwidth. So fiber optics carry much more information than a coaxial cable would carry, which carries microwave frequencies. And that's why fiber optics are really such an important device in delivering large amounts of data. Why do we use infrared light? Um, well, one of the reasons, and unfortunately my PowerPoint got shifted a little bit. I'm not sure. This little 1.3 should be sitting right at that valley. And this 1.55 should be sitting at that valley right there. But if you look at this, this is an attenuation graph, which shows you how much light is attenuated, um, how many decibels. For every 10 decibels, we lose uh, a factor of 10. No, not a factor of 10. We lose... 90% um, of the signal. And we can see uh, going in the visible part of the spectrum, the attenuation is very, very large. But down in the infrared part of the spectrum, the attenuation is more than a magnitude less. And therefore, you can send 
infrared optical signals much farther than you can send visible optical signals on a fiber optic. Why is this important? It means that you don't have to keep amplifying your signal. So again, fiber optics, we think that we're sending visible light through them. It's just not practical. We typically will send infrared light through them. Near infrared, uh, near infrared does overlap into uh, the fiber optics, but it's also known for night vision. Uh, night vision only not only intensifies the light that the person is receiving, it also allows the viewer to see near infrared, uh, which is normally invisible to the uh, to the human eye. Visible light, we won't go over in too much detail here. Visible light is the narrowest band of electromagnetic spectrum. You know, technically, it's not the narrowest in terms of the, 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 the bandwidth. But on a logarithmic scale, it would appear to be the narrowest. It only goes from 590 nanometers up to about 780 nanometers. Um, you know, 390 represents the edge of the violet part of the spectrum. 780 represents red. And roughly, if you, you have to think about the wavelength of light, it's about half of a micron or roughly about 500 nanometers. And again, here's a rainbow. We'll talk about dispersion later on, how white light is separated into all these different colors. And what's interesting is not all colors, there's, there's six recognized colors, not all colors have an equal bandwidth on the spectrum. Red actually is the, has the largest bandwidth and then green. So when we look at this, um, really, yellow and orange are very, very narrow. And we'll talk more about how the eye detects different colors. We actually have three pigments in our retina that allow us to um, sense three different ranges of color. And our eye will process signals from these different, um, I guess these would be the cones in the eye, and tell us exactly what color it is. Even though we have three pigments, we can sense a much larger range of colors. <coughs> now we get to ultraviolet, okay? We've gone from infrared to visible. Now we're on this side where the wavelength is getting smaller, the frequency is getting higher, and the energy per photon is getting larger. Now, that means ultraviolet light is the first part of the electromagnetic spectrum which is ionizing radiation. This is important because it has enough energy to break chemical bonds. Visible light actually can create photochemical reactions in our eye and that's how we can see it. But now we're to ultraviolet light where we can damage organic matter. Specifically, we can alter the chemical bonds which are in DNA. Okay, so this becomes dangerous. It's ionizing radiation. Ionizing meaning it can remove an electron from an atom. It can break a bond. Now, ultraviolet light uh, starts at 390 nanometers. And by our way of defining things, we're going to go up to 10 nanometers. And we can break ultraviolet light up uh, different ways. We can break it up according to A, B, and C, UVA, UVB, UVC. <clears throat> and we can break it up according to near, middle, far, and extreme. So let's look at what it looks like on spectrum. Again, here's visible. Um, if we use the, the term UVA, UVB, UVC, these are parts of the ultraviolet spectrum, which are very close not very close, are closer to the visible part of the spectrum. If we go beyond this, then that's typical, typically considered vacuum ultraviolet, um, even though UVC is actually vacuum ultraviolet too, but it's just, it, it doesn't typically fall within this classification. The other classification, near, middle, far, extreme, 
<coughs> similar to what we saw with the classification of infrared, where you're talking about, are you near the visible part of the spectrum, okay? Or are you, you know, farther away in frequency? Now, UVA, UVA, 95% of all the ultraviolet light that makes it through the atmosphere, that makes it through the stratosphere, that gets through the ozone layer, 95% of that light is going to be UVA. These frequencies don't tend to be absorbed as much by the ozone layer. Most glass is transparent to UVA, so it will pass through glass, and this will penetrate deep into the skin. UVA is something that you want to be careful of because it causes skin cancer and it causes premature aging. All right, that's the stuff that you really want to block with sunscreen. Even though UVB has more energy, it doesn't penetrate as deeply as UVA. In fact, it doesn't penetrate the atmosphere very much at all. 5% of the UV light that reaches the surface of the Earth is UVB. It doesn't easily pass through glass, is only intense in the middle of the day, and does not penetrate as deep into the skin, but it does cause sunburns and is much more likely to lead to skin cancer than even UVA. So you want to protect yourself from this. Then we get to UVC, okay? Here's the interesting thing about UVC. It's blocked, okay? It doesn't make it through the atmosphere. UVC is blocked by the ozone layer. When it used to reach the surface of the earth before we had an ozone layer, okay, before there's uh, molecular oxygen in the atmosphere to then be converted into to ozone. We couldn't have any land life because the UVC would come down and sterilize all the life. It would kill off all the life. So UVC, um, that would, if, if, if the ozone layer would go away, UVC would end life on the surface of the earth. Still would be fine in the ocean, but UVC would be a catastrophe. The strange thing is UVC doesn't penetrate very deeply into our skin. So it's not so much of a hazard to us as much. In fact, UVC is created by mercury lights with quartz envelopes around them. And it's used to kill bacteria and viruses. Makes sense, right? If UVC would have killed microscopic life on land before the ozone layer, it's gonna kill microscopic life uh, if it's artificially created and again, we can sterilize surfaces with this. When the coronavirus was first coming on the scene, um, many hospitals were actually using these types of sterilizing uh, lamps to uh, kill off um, pathogens. <coughs> we have to worry about ultraviolet exposure. As I said, it does cause skin cancer. It does cause premature aging. So um, we have something called the ultraviolet index which indicates how much ultraviolet light is making to the surface of the Earth. The index goes from 0 to 11 plus. And on a typical winter day, you know, gloomy day um, in January, your UV index won't get above 1. But as we get into the summer or as we go to lower latitudes, the sunlight is more direct. It passes through an effectively thinner part of the ozone layer and more of it makes it to the surface. So when it's low, you know, we still recommend that you wear uh, sunscreen and sunglasses, um, medium from three to five. You want to be careful, but as soon as it gets high, uh, stay out of the direct sunlight. You know, any UV index from six and above, you really don't want to expose yourself uh, to the sunlight very much especially if you're as pale as a ghost like myself. Um, if you do have to go on the sun, sunscreen, sunglasses, um, hat, don't stay out in the sun, okay? It's just not good for you. We can't see near UV because the lenses of our eye and our, our cornea will absorb ultraviolet light. But some insects and some birds have some transparency to near ultraviolet. So here we see um, sunflowers as seen by our eyes. And then these are pictures taken with ultraviolet film. And we can see that some of these flowers actually 
create patterns which are intended only to be seen by certain insects and birds. <laughs> Here is one of those mercury lamps. These have a quartz envelope. Typically, a fluorescent lamp, an old style fluorescent lamp, which is still used today, has phosphor on the inside of the glass envelope and the glass itself does not allow ultraviolet C to get through. You have to have the special quartz envelope. So fluorescent lights really don't produce a lot of ultraviolet light. But these lamps are specifically designed to produce ultraviolet light. And again, um, they are created by simply passing electricity through a mercury vapor. Ultraviolet, even though it's ionizing radiation, even though it's dangerous to us, far ultraviolet light is very, very important to the manufacture of small microprocessors, small integrated chips. Now, originally, photolithography, basically printing transistors on a silicon wafer using light, <coughs> was done with visible light. But we can only focus visible light down to about the size of the wavelength of visible light, down to about 500 nanometers. So once manufacturers wanted to go to smaller transistors, smaller transistors can be packed onto a silicon wafer, a silicon chip at higher and higher densities, but they can also operate faster. Once we want to go to these faster speeds, these smaller transistors, we needed smaller wavelengths of light. So we went to far ultraviolet. And um, many of the machines use 193 nanometers from an argon fluoride laser. Um, it's called an excimer laser. Actually, I think they use the same laser. I might be wrong. They might use the same laser to do LASIK surgery. But even this is starting to seem too large. So um, some of the manufacturers have gone to uh, extremely short wavelengths. <clears throat> and these newest uh, chip foundries will actually vaporize tin and use the tin vapor to produce extremely, extremely short wavelengths in the uh, extreme ultraviolet part of the, the spectrum. Now, the problem here is when you're going to these really short wavelengths, you know, the far ultraviolet and the extreme ultraviolet, you can't use lenses anymore to focus the light. Glass is not transparent to ultraviolet wavelengths. So we actually have to go to a system of mirrors. And you can see the system of mirrors shown right here where we focus the light, and all this is done in a vacuum. We focus the light onto our microchip or onto our wafer and uh, print the transistors on there using photolithography. These, these machines are incredibly expensive. There's only one company that makes them. Um, and as you can see, it's ASML. They are a Dutch subsidiary of Philips Electronics. And these machines themselves can be hundreds of millions of dollars. That's why there's only one company that makes them. So when we ran into a chip shortage, it wasn't just like, oh, all of a sudden we can suddenly just create more machines that create more chips. These machines that cost hundreds of millions of, of dollars uh, take over a year to build. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the exact time that they take to the build. So when we needed to ramp up to make more and more chips, it wasn't something we could do overnight. This shows us the progress that we've made in terms of the different wavelengths that we've used uh, to print chips. And here you can see in the 1960s and 70s, we're still using visible light. Um, as we got to smaller and smaller, we had to go to um, different lines it found in mercury lamps the G line and the I line. Then we had to go to a krypton fluoride laser. Uh, below that, uh, argon fluoride. And then um, these tin vapor lasers 
which operate in the extreme ultraviolet that produce wavelengths of 13 nanometers, um, those those are now going to become the, uh, the standard for uh, chip manufacturing. Again, the downside of ultraviolet light, it's ionizing radiation. And we are, fortunately, we are protected by an ozone layer. If the ozone layer had not formed, life on land would never have originated. So the ozone layer protects life on Earth from ultraviolet light. Now let's jump to the X-ray part of the spectrum. Next to ultraviolet, at a higher frequency, at a shorter wavelength, are X-rays. <laughs> X-rays and ultraviolet light are produced by the inner electrons of an atom. Really, the middle and inner electrons will produce ultraviolet light. The innermost electrons are needed to produce X-rays. X-rays are made of photons of very high energy. They have uh, the ability to pen penetrate deep into different objects. That's curious because UVA, which was the longest wavelength, was the most penetrating. UVC was the least penetrating. Now we're going the other way around and X-rays are suddenly more trans... I wouldn't say materials are more transparent to X-rays than they are to, to uh, ultraviolet. In fact, the higher the frequency of the X-ray, the higher the energy of the X-ray, the more it, get, it penetrates material and the less it's actually absorbed. So X-rays are made by simply taking electrons, accelerating them into a material like tungsten that has a high atomic number and very tightly bound inner electrons. And as the electrons collide, with the metal atoms, they will slow down producing Brem, Brem Strahlung radiation, and they'll also kick off the inner electrons and produce what's known as characteristic X-rays. So here is the basic way that we classify X-rays. Soft X-rays are X-rays that are close to the UV part of the spectrum. Soft X-rays are not as penetrating. Quite frankly, they don't have as many applications. Hard X-rays are what we use to um, essentially create medical X-rays, look inside packages um, at airports, very penetrating radiation. It's ionizing. Yes, when you get a medical X-ray, you're getting some ionizing radiation, but at such a low level, your body does fine handling it. So again, production of X-rays, it was first done by um Wilhelm Rentgen uh he was a German scientist and most of the world actually calls him Rentgen rays I'm not quite sure but we stuck to the term x-ray which is kind of weird because x-ray means unknown so we're just kind of saying we're unknown rays but we know that they're electromagnetic rays the modern x-ray tube accelerates electrons onto a spinning tungsten target it's spinning because if the electron beam was kept on a fixed spot it would quickly erode and overheat the target so by spinning it you can disperse the energy and it can cool itself down this is all done in in a vacuum um and br a beryllium window is used to allow the x-rays out of the the vacuum too essentially x-rays will cast um, light through the body, the body casts a shadow. The shadow is then projected onto photographic film or a charge coupled device to produce an image. And that's how we get an X-ray. The X-ray itself is actually a negative. Where the X-rays go through becomes dark. Where the X-rays don't penetrate, such as bone has calcium, which absorbs X-rays very well, you will get a light image. And again, this is the X-ray spectrum. The K alpha and the K beta are actually transitions of inner electrons, whereas the much broader peak is uh, what we call Bremsstrahlung radiation from electrons slowing down in the metal. And again, you can see 
Here comes an incoming electron. It accelerates around the atom to produce brown strong radiation, or it can kick off an electron to produce these characteristic X-rays. X-ray diffraction, very, very important in crystallography. X-ray diffraction allows us to identify the distance between the crystal planes and the actual structure of the crystals themselves. Uh, X-ray crystal crystallography allowed us to see the structure of the double helix of DNA. And um, that, of course, is very, very important because DNA carries the information uh, for ourselves. It's the information storage that allows us to, uh, you know, stores all the information for the proteins in our body, you know, all the different things that our body needs to do. So um, X-ray diffraction helped us realize what this important nucleic acid uh, looked like. An interesting application of X-rays is um, actually in the use of direct, well, in a microscopy. Here's the thing. If you use an optical microscope, a microscope which is, uses visible light, you can't see any detail smaller than the wavelength of light. Okay? So your best hope is really to see objects on the order of one micron, one millionth of a meter. Okay? You can't see anything smaller with the visible light. We use electron microscopes because we can make the wavelength of the electron very, very small. But the problem is the electrons have to be used in a vacuum. And typically the samples that we use can't be living. We have developed ultraviolet microscopes. But interestingly, we've actually been able to develop X-ray microscopes, which don't use any lenses at all. They use mirrors. And here you can see the result. This was taken with a 2.4 nanometer um, X-ray, probably produced at um, a synchrotron, a, a particle accelerator. And we can see a normal red cell right here. And we can see the parasites, which produce malaria, which have taken over this red cell right here. You would never see that detail with visible light because in essence, you are talking about something that has 200 times better resolution in the soft X-rays. You know, you can see something 200 times smaller um, than you can with visible light. Hard X-rays, again, used for medical imaging. This is an actual CAT scan that allows us to create three-dimensional reconstructions inside the body. Um, Regular medical x-rays don't expose you to very much ionizing radiation. CAT scans give you a bit more, so uh, got to be careful there. And here is a test item. This is not an actual package that was intercepted by the, by the uh, TSC. This is a test item to actually test the imaging. And you can see here's a fake grenade, a, a knife, uh, you know, fake explosives with a, a detonating charge there. So um, I guess that's that's used for training. X-rays are important in astronomy. Very hot objects, objects that are over a million degrees Kelvin will give off X-rays. That includes solar corona, a supernova remnant. Um, well, th this is actually a supernova remnant which is a pulsar. This is a supernova remnant, which is from an exploded star. Um, here is a black hole. All these very extreme objects reach very high temperatures and give off X-rays as a result. Now we're to the final part of the spectrum, gamma rays. Gamma rays are the highest energy per photon, the shortest wavelength, and the highest frequency. The most common source for gamma rays are radioactive nuclei. And our fear of nuclear radiation is primarily due to gamma rays. Here's a picture of Chernobyl after its disaster. 
<clears throat> and we can see the roof is blown off here, exposing the core of the reactor. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this ended up spreading a lot of radio uh, isotopes in the surrounding region, which were giving off radioactive particles um, such as alpha, beta, and gamma rays. When gamma rays were first discovered, they didn't know what they were. In fact, there are three types of radiation that they identified, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays, or I should say alpha rays, beta rays, gamma rays. Again, like X-rays, they were unknown, so they were just given Greek letters. Today, we know alpha particles are helium nuclei, beta particles are electrons, and gamma rays are electromagnetic waves. In the gamma ray spectrum, almost all the gamma rays are down here, okay? With energies greater than around 100 kiloelectron volts, um, up to about, I don't know, about eight mega electron volts. That is a typical gamma ray that we get from the decay of a nucleus. That's a typical gamma ray that we might see from uh, most astronomical phenomena such as supernova. Once we get to higher energies and higher frequencies, these type of gamma rays become really, really uncommon. High energy gamma rays um, between 10 mega electron volts and 100 giga electron volts are uncommon, but we do see them from phenomena such as supernova, uh, even though lower energy gamma rays are, are, are seen at a higher intensity for these events. We see them for active galactic nuclei, the, the surrounding regions. Uh, of a black hole at the center of a galaxy. And in the most extreme examples, we get very high energy gamma rays, much less common. And then the records uh, for most energetic gamma rays are way out here in the uh, peta electron volt range. Um, these two types of gamma rays, can, you almost never see them, okay? They are the rare event that are probably caused by the acceleration of particles near a supermassive black hole, which is active, what we call a quasar. In fact, they're called blazars because it's a quasar with its axis of rotation pointed toward us. So gamma rays, most of your gamma rays are down here. Rare events, however, can produce some of these higher energy gamma rays, which are really quite remarkable in terms of the energy that they carry for a very small particle. So let's look at some examples of gamma rays. How are they produced? Well, like the X-ray and the ultraviolet light and the visible light, there is a transition that takes place. It's a quantum mechanical transition that takes place. For visible light, for ultraviolet light, for x-rays, it's the electrons that are going from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. That's how they're produced. Gamma rays, they're produced when the nucleus, well, technically, when the protons and neutrons drop from a higher energy state to a lower energy state within the nucleus. Now, nuclear energies are much greater than electronic energies, and thus, the energies involved in these gamma rays are far greater than your typical ultraviolet light, your X-ray, your visible light. So here we have boron-12. Um, boron doesn't like to have 12 nucleons, okay? Five protons, seven neutrons. Um, that's not really where it wants to be. So it decays into carbon. It converts one of the neutrons into a proton. But as it decays in the carbon, it leaves the carbon in an excited state. It gives off charge in the form of an electron, a beta particle. It gives off a neutrino. But um, again, it still has more energy than the ground state of carbon-12. So this excited 
carbon 12, what we say is in a metastable state. Meta meaning, you know, really temporarily. Stable, talking about, you know, it's going to stay at that particular energy. It decays into the ground state of carbon 12 <clears throat> and gives off a gamma ray. Here's another example of um, paranisotope giving off a particle. This time it gives off an alpha particle. The daughter isotope still has more energy than it should. So it gives off a gamma ray for the nucleus to drop in the ground state. Sometimes we can get a um, multiple uh, decay. This is cobalt-60. Cobalt-60 is a radioisotope. And as we can see here, it has a half-life of 5.272. I assume the A means annual. So 5.272 years is a half-life. And when that decays, it either decays in this upper state into nickel-60 by giving off a beta particle, an electron, or to this middle state. In either case, it has to drop and lose energy. If it's in this upper state, it drops to the middle state. Once it reaches the middle state, it drops to the bottom state. So when cobalt decays, there are actually two gamma rays that are given off. You can use a gamma ray spectrometer if it is equipped to do this, if it's equipped to determine the energy, and you can measure the energy of the peaks and say, we have cobalt-60 present in this particular sample. Cobalt-60 is a very common radioisotope, which is used in uh, radiation medicine. It's a source of beta particles. It's also a source of um, gamma rays. Now, gamma rays are particularly dangerous because they go through just about everything. X-rays are penetrating, gamma rays are even more penetrating. We're typically not worried about alpha particles unless we inhale radon gas, which gives off alpha particles and the bismuth that decays into also gives off alpha, alpha particles, or we take in some radioactive isotope like polonium, which gives off alpha particles. It's not an external threat to us because the alpha particles, they won't even go through the air. They don't go through a piece of paper. Electrons are a little more dangerous as beta particles because they do penetrate through you know thin layers of skin, but also it doesn't take very much to stop them. In order to stop a gamma ray, you either need lead or thick concrete. So um, it's ionizing radiation. It can cause cancer if it's absorbed. So we have to shield against it to protect ourselves. Here is a picture of a nuclear power plant with two containment buildings. The containment buildings are thick concrete. If ever any problem happened with the reactor core, these buildings would have to contain um, any of the radioactive elements that escaped. So uh, this thick concrete would shield or protect anybody on the outside from radiation exposure. Here's some common isotopes in their gamma ray emissions. Um, radon, I'm sorry, it's radium. Radium-226, which produces radon gas, gives off gamma rays around 210 kiloelectron volts. Uh, cesium, cesium-137, was a common isotope from nuclear reactors. Uh, when the Chernobyl plant exploded, radioactive cesium was one of the, the primary hazards, giving off gamma rays at 661.8 kiloelectron volts. And here you can see potassium-40 is a common radioisotope in rocks. It's used for radioactive dating. It gives off a gamma ray at 1.46 mega electron volts. So going back to our spectrum, going back to our spectrum, these are gamma rays down here, anywhere from a few hundred kilo electron volts up to a few mega electron volts. That's where gamma radiation is going to be given off 
by radioisotopes. When we get to more extreme events, they also tend to give off gamma rays in the kill electron and mega electron range, but they also give off some more energetic gamma rays. Here is uh, a supernova, which exploded in 1987, uh, that exploded in a nearby galaxy. Uh, here is a gamma ray burst, which is typically the merger of two neutron stars or a star collapsing into a black hole. Um, even neutron stars called magnetars can give off bursts of X-rays. Whenever we see X-rays in astronomy, we know a very violent event is taking place because gamma rays are only given off by events that involve temperatures of in billions of degrees. Very, very violent. Now, here's something that's that's interesting. This is sort of a mystery in astronomy. And giga electron volts, just to remind you where this is in the, the spectrum of, of gamma rays, giga electron volt excess. Pull our chart back, okay? Here are normal gamma rays, the gamma rays that we typically expect from radioactive decay and most other astronomical events. Giga electron volts, which are here, can be produced by things uh, such as neutron stars, energetic, other types of events in astronomy, but um, that's rare. And a gamma ray telescope known as Fermi has mapped the sky and detected some of these giga electron volt sources, okay? Again, they're shining much brighter in the, in the mega electron volt and kill electron volt, but here at the at the gig electron volt, we see what are probably active galactic nuclei, um, quasars way off in the distance, giving off these gamma rays. But what we also see is there's an excess of these gamma rays near the plane of our galaxy. Some astronomers have claimed that these are probably just neutron stars that we can't resolve into individual um, <clears throat> sources. But another really cool theory, and I, you know, I always hope this is true because we've been looking for dark matter. One theory is <clears throat> that these gamma rays are actually produced by the annihilation of dark matter particles called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. Now, <clears throat> when a proton, and, I'm sorry, when it, an electron and an anti-electron known as a positron, when they annihilate, they give off energies about half a mega electron volt, okay? These dark matter particles, if they're much more massive and they annihilate with their antimatter form, they would give off much higher energies, equals mc squared. If they're more massive, they're gonna give off more energy. So some have, have predicted that this giga electron volt excess from, from the the plane of the, our galaxy is actually dark matter, which is congregated in the densest part of our galaxy. So that would be really interesting. If that is true, uh, I can't really say how speculative that is. It seems somewhat speculative. The very highest energy gamma rays, those that you saw on the very far end of the spectrum, we believe these are given off by quasars. These are incredibly massive black holes in younger galaxies where we still have matter falling into the black hole. And as they create uh, these bipolar jets, they accelerate particles near to the speed of light and their interaction with other matter generates these extremely high um, energy gamma rays and extremely high energy cosmic rays. Okay, that's it. So that is our tour of the electromagnetic spectrum. Again, you know, familiarize yourself with the seven parts, but um, that's really made to be a tour and, and, and show you, you know, how these different parts of, of the electromagnetic spectrum are important.